Yes, we do. Thank you, Lord.
ago, in a time of prayer, the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, Keith, anytime something looks too big, too hard, you're not looking at me. Is that right? You're looking at the problem. You're not looking at him because with him, nothing, nothing, nothing is too big. Nothing is too hard. Not going to be. Not going to be discouraged. Not going to be. Not going to be afraid. an incurable disease no such thing with God no such thing it's too big of an amount too big of a bill too hard of a problem nothing nothing nothing's too big for my God nothing's too big for my God nothing's too big for my God worship you in these places today. We say there's no other God. There's no one like you. No one above you. Oh, thank you that we belong to you. Thank you that you have heard and answered our prayers again and again and again. Thank you. Thank you that you brought us through you brought us over. You got us this far. And you will take us the rest of the way. All the way. All the way. Sing it again. One of the strongest acts of faith from us is not being scared about tomorrow. That's one of the strongest acts of faith that no matter what you're looking at, what you're feeling, what you're dealing with, you breathe a sigh of relief and you lean back on the everlasting arms and you say, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. Because there's nothing too big for God, and He loves us, and He's faithful to us. Hallelujah! Are you glad to be in church this morning? Glad to be able to be? Look around, smile at somebody close by you. Let them know they're around friendly people. Nice people say, hey there, good to see you. Good to be with you. Good morning. 
<laughs> Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Yes. Wow, this was wonderful worship service, wasn't it? Thank you, Lord. Oh, he's so good to us. Yes, well, welcome. Do we have any first-time visitors with us this morning? Oh, stand if you'd like or wave, whichever you'd like. Wonderful. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, wow. Welcome all over this place. Well, we are so glad you've joined us this morning. Welcome, welcome online. Welcome in Sarasota. We're glad you're out there too. We love y'all. So glad that you're a part with us. Good day. Well, a couple of announcements for you this morning. We have got um, Nathan Nathaniel Bassey coming really soon. Yes. He is a well-known, if you didn't know, he's a well-known Nigerian trumpeter, singer, and songwriter, has ministered in Abuja when Brother Moore has been, been there. And so he will be ministering here in Branson on Friday, September 6th. This is a free concert, so invite people to come. It's going to be great. He's got a website you can look at. And also, we have um, cards at the info counter for invitations to invite people. It's nice to have a little colorful flyer when you invite people. So they're at the counter in Branson uh, today and next Sunday. So um, get some. We've got lots, so you can help, help yourself to as many as you'd like. And then also we have child presentations coming up this fall at both churches. So if you would like your child presented to the Lord, there is a form at the counter you can fill out for that. And now, did you celebrate any birthdays or anniversaries? Okay, welcome behind. Okay, hi, happy birthday. Wonderful. Happy birthday. Okay, let's see. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Wow, lots of birthdays. Happy birthday back there. Hi, happy anniversary. How many? Is it? I can't see it very well. 43. Happy anniversary. Congratulations. Okay, happy birthday back there. Happy birthday. Okay, anybody else? Didn't want to miss anybody. All right, well, let's take a look at Sarasota. Good morning. That's our sweet family. Oh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. All kinds of great birthdays this month. Oh, happy anniversary. How many? Uh, 45? Four, oh, oh. Is that, how, was it 49? Is that right? Oh, no. Uh-oh. Oh, and you're 45 back there? Okay, got you. Okay, now you. How many? I'm sorry. I know. I'm Oh, oh boy. Nine, nine. Happy anniversary. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> That's great. It's good we can have fun in church and laugh, yes. Oh, anybody else? I'll try to get it right. <laughs> it's your anniversary. Oh, is that all? I think so. All right, well, happy anniversary. Happy birthday, everybody. Eat cake. Celebrate. <laughs> it's a good thing to celebrate. <laughs> now, I've got some really good testimonies this morning. This one is that on Saturday, was ha she was having symptoms of vertigo and was feeling dizzy. And so on Sunday morning, she was supposed to be singing um, here in Branson and was still feeling uh, dizzy. So called her team leader and told them, and they prayed for her. And she said by mid-morning, she was healed. Yeah. Glory to God. And then at work, she, um, she was in her office and heard a huge boom that shook the building, saw flashes of light, and then heard a loud crash in the office down the hall not far from her. Immediately, uh, the wall caught on fire by the explosion, and the whole floor filled with smoke. Um, they, the guys took a fire extinguisher but couldn't get it out. They all evacuated the building and called the fire department, which they got it out quickly. Uh, it turned out a vacuum cleaner battery pack had exploded in the housekeeping office. 
And the real praise here is that she had just gone down that hall a half hour and put her lunch away. And there was also a girl who had been sitting in that room and she had got up and done rounds. So nobody was hurt. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then this one, the Lord provided us a place of our own. We sowed into good ground, into the ministry, especially in the February project, and now we have reaped a beautiful home. Thank you, Lord. This one said, God gave me a new-to-me car, and he healed me from depression and diabetes. Thank you, Lord. And this one said, I was delivered from smoking two packs a day for 37 years. Was listening to the CD, and when Brother Moore was telling the man how to get free with speaking the word every time he lit up a cigarette, she goes, I thought this will work for me. So every time she lit up, she spoke the word, and she said about a week, maybe, yeah, miraculously set free in about a week. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. So good. And this one said, um, I'm a partner and big fan of faith school. I have listened to all the faith schools on the site, and I listen every night at 9 p.m. on Victory. She said, and then there's two messages that have greatly impacted my life from the Believer's Convention 23 and 24. I frequently wake up hearing you sing, I'm free, Jesus set me free, and now I find myself being prompted by the Holy Spirit to bounce thoughts as they attempt to enter my mind. It really makes me laugh every time one of these events occur, but I cannot deny the effectiveness of the prompting. What is truly remarkable and supernatural is the fact that the moment I say I bounce that thought, it leaves. I've even thought of having a t-shirt made saying bounce that thought. (laughs) It'd be a good t-shirt. And this one is precious, said, we were so blessed by, the minist- by your ministry and from the Southwest Believers Convention message on the deliverance from all sorrow and grief. Our son took a premature departure to heaven not quite a year ago, and thank you, Lord, we are free at last. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand up and thank the Lord this morning. Father, we are so thankful, thankful for the word the precious word, Father, that does make us free, that, that pays our bills, blesses us with, with all kinds of blessings, Father. We are so grateful. You are faithful and good. Lord, we rejoice with all of these, Father, and we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Those are good reports, aren't they? Praise God, praise God, praise God. I think I'll keep telling that story about the <laughs> quit smoking. And, uh, smoking for 30 something years, 37 years, two packs a day, and got free in a week. Don't you know they had tried all kind of stuff in all those years? Well, it works on more than smoking. So, uh, uh, if you're interested in more of that, ask the folks back at the information area. You can go online with our stuff. Everything's available at no charge, and you can hear the same messages they were talking about. And how about that uh, healed of diabetes, freed from depression, and got a new car to them? Man, God will, God will fix you up. Is, is there a better deal anywhere in the world? No. Say it out loud what he's done for others. He's doing for me. me. And greater things than these these shall we see. see. All the glory. All the glory. All the glory. glory. Be to our great God. Lord, we're rejoicing in all the good things you've done for our brothers and sisters. Thank you so much. And we're expecting a whole lot more. Looking forward to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. What a great thing it is to know the Lord, to get free, to live free. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, Go with me to Matthew, if you would, the uh, 16th chapter. And um, it's offering time. 
So what we do in offering time is we stir ourselves up. Faith comes by hearing. And uh, faith in every area comes by hearing the word in that area. Um, I know I had the privilege of working at Brother Kenneth Hagin's ministry for a number of years and working in his uh, healing school. And after years of, uh, you know, healing in the morning, healing in the afternoon, healing when the sun went down, uh, I, that was just what, what we did. We, thought, we looked at it, we fed on it, we preached it, we taught it, we sang about it. And after years of that, I realized I had been going for, for months and months and months and, and even a year, no symptoms at all. None. No colds, no anything. And, I'm, and then one day it dawned on me, you need to hear some more about finances. Because <laughs> our finances wasn't so good. It, it really does work that way. It really does work that And your faith might be strong in one area, but weak in another area because it hasn't been fed and you haven't used it in that area. And so that's why we'll take a few minutes offering time to feed our faith on these things so that we don't just go through the ritual of an offering, but we actually release faith. You can't release what you don't have. And how do you get it? By hearing. Hallelujah. Matthew 16, 26. Matthew 16, 26. Jesus said, What is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The scripture tells us in Peter that we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. What that means is he's asking here, what, what would you pay for your soul? And there's not enough silver and gold and money in the world to equal the value of one human soul. There was only one thing in all the universe that was worth enough to buy and redeem our soul. It was the precious blood of the spotless lamb of God. Hallelujah. Somebody say, thank you, Lord, for redeeming me. But what you'll see is, look at that verse again. He said, uh, what does it profit a person if they gained the whole world? Now that's talking about all the, everything that people seek in it, the money, the stuff, the buildings, the lands, the cars, the clothes, the notoriety, all of that. If you had a hundred years down here and you were the richest, most popular, successful person around and then you died and lost your soul, what did you do? Nothing. You accomplished nothing. You lost everything, wow. right? It meant nothing. Now, go with me, if you would, to uh, Mark, the 16th chapter. Mark 16 and 15. And this passage is known by many as the Great Commission. Jesus said, this is uh, after he had been to the cross, after he had been raised, and he's about to ascend on high. And he gave these instructions to the church. Go ye into all the world. People sometimes have found fault with us and says, what does a church need with an airplane? Have you ever read the Great Commission? First word is go. Hmm? And there's different levels of going. And there's worse ways of going and better ways of going. And people say, well, you'd save a lot of money by riding, you know, the airline. Well, you'd save even more by riding the bus. <laughs> and you'd save even more by walking. Hmm? Right. Where, where's the standard? Where's the line? Who gets to set it? Why is your idea the standard? Y'all with me? What you don't save by walking or riding the bus is time. 
And time is more valuable than money. Hmm? It is the most limited resource we have. This thing's soon going to be over and done. Hmm? And so he said, go into all the world and do what? Preach or proclaim the good news to every created being. And verse 16, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. So that, then that means their soul would be saved. He that believes not will be damned, or that means the, that word can also be translated condemned. They won't be saved. The greatest need of human beings is not natural. It's spiritual. Now, yeah, you need something to eat. You need something to wear. You need a place to lay your head. Yes, you do. But you can have all that and lose your soul and you've done nothing with your whole life. You've lost everything. So the greatest need of human beings is spiritual, which why, why that, the Lord didn't just say, go into all the world and feed people. Amen. Go into all the world and clothe people, house people. The, it's important to help people in need. But I'm not the source. I can't meet everybody's need, nor can you. We can do our part what the Lord shows us. But the biggest thing is do you know him? Amen. Have you heard the gospel? Yes. Have you received him? Yes. Right? And you'll also find that the one who saved your soul, he'll also get you some food. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And get you some new clothes. Yes. Get you a good place to live. Yes. Right? I mean, everything, uh, that's what the Romans 8 says, if God spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? When he gave us Jesus, he gave us everything else. It's all in him. Can you say amen? amen. But our every church's priority, every ministry's priority, every believer's priority should be this, getting the gospel, which is how God saves people, into all the world. Amen. Hallelujah. That's number one. Everything else falls below that. Amen. Is a secondary importance. So uh, are you in agreement with that? That yes. let's, let's band together. Let's use our strength. Let's use our time. Let's use our resources to do this. Go into all the world. And, and Jesus said when this gospel. Yes. Not what some people call the gospel. But th when this gospel is preached. To all the world, then the end will come. This thing's going to wind up, and we're going to blow this popsicle stand. We're, we're out of here, but until then, that's work. To get this job done till he comes. Can you say amen? Well, they uh, give you the good report on things that are going on in the churches. The go supply this past week was... Uh, uh, almost 0.7 to 1 covering our expense. This covers all of our travel. Everywhere we go, uh, it costs people nothing for us to come to them. They never get a bill from us for travel or our hotels or any of that because it's covered by the ghost supply. Uh, you heard Kim talking about Brother uh, Bassey. Well, we've, uh, that last several years, we've gone to Abuja, Nigeria, Africa, uh, and holding meetings there. And uh, Brother Bassi, he's from Lagos, uh, other part of the country in Nigeria. And he's been, he and his group have been special music in those meetings. And just a wonderful brother, anointed, anointed, wonderful. God's given him amazing songs. And I've asked him about coming. It's been years, but you know, uh, Africa's not just around the block. I mean, you, <laughs> right? I mean, it's a, it's a commitment and, and also the team, but they're coming. Yeah. And so... Uh, uh, invite people, really. This will be uh, an evangelistic outreach as well because they'll hear the gospel in song and sometimes people will come to hear good music when they wouldn't come to hear preaching. So bring them, bring them on in. And, uh, right? And uh, uh, our go supply, like I mentioned, that is, uh, it's well supplied. And then the word supply. This covers all of our materials. I mean, we've got, uh, we still got CD discs uh, showing on the graphic. Uh, you know, we still, we still distribute them, right? People still ask for them. I see a bunch of people nodding their head. Yeah, you, you got a CD player, I guess. <laughs> well, at least we don't have cassettes, right? I mean, we, 
we've moved past the cassette, but uh, for years it was cassettes, but mostly it's downloads now. And, uh, and, we, and all that we have, all of our teaching, preaching, um, messages, video, uh, broadcast, downloads, music, I mean, the thing, all of it's available at no charge to anybody, anywhere. Well, it costs a lot to produce it. How can you not charge for it? Well, uh, people sow into the word supply and it underwrites it. So this past week for every dollar we spent, we had 65 cents come in. But the week or two prior to that, we had over one to one and we only spent 10% of our reserves. So we're in good shape. Amen. Word supply is well supplied. Amen. Ushers, would you wait on the people? If you want to get involved in any of these things today in the offerings by cash or by credit card, raise your hand, take an envelope for cash giving or credit card giving. If you're making out a check, make it out to FLC. That stands for Faith Life Church, FLC. Text to give is on the screen. If you're watching online, there's a button you can click on that says sewing. You can get involved that way. If you want something to go to the uh, Go supply or word supply, designate that. Uh, if you don't designate it, that's great too. It can go whatever direction we need at the time. And a substantial portion of the general offerings goes outside our walls. It goes, <clears throat> all of our stuff is paid for. Yes. So we can sow more and more outside of ourselves. And uh, mission work and other ministries, we realize we are not the church. We're a part of the church. We're not the body of Christ. We're a part of the body of Christ. And we want to have some uh, seed in, in other things so that we'll have part of that reward too. And uh, somebody else that's really reaching a group maybe that we're not reaching as much with the gospel. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Need an envelope? Raise your hand real high. Making out a check, like we said, make it to FLC and when you're ready, you can stand with us. And there's no rush. Take your time. If you're writing, finish writing. And uh, then stand. And aren't we glad that we have something to give, that yes. we're, we're able to sow a seed? And don't despise a small seed because the Lord uh, can do a lot with a little. Yes, sir. Remember the little boy's lunch? Right. Hold up your offering. Hold up your hand. Said out loud, Father God, you are my source, unlimited, unfailing. Because of your goodness, I don't lack for any good thing, but we always have abundance and plenty to give as you direct. Thank you for increasing us more and more, us and our children, for blessing us big and making us a big blessing to a lot of people, to the furtherance of your gospel, the building of your church, to your glory, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Father, as your under shepherds, we speak over the people as they bring these things to you and by the authority and by the anointing and in the name of Jesus, we say, be blessed, be encouraged, be strengthened and enabled and empowered to succeed and rise higher and go further and advance in every good thing. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I receive it. I am blessed. Hallelujah. What's going on in the Faith Life family? We're getting our buildings, our lands, our houses, our vehicles, and our equipment. When we started saying this, what, 22 years ago over to the property, we were leasing. We didn't own a building. We didn't own any property. And we started saying this. Now, not only was that building, that property paid for, now this building and this property and, and 70 acres here. 
joining the strip is, is ours. Faith Life Church and paid for. And Sarasota, that what, 40,000 square foot? Hey, excuse me, 80. Man, what was I thinking? <laughs> something else. That's a, some, another project. 80,000 square foot facility sitting on 10 acres right there in Sarasota is paid for. Yeah. Woo! Oh, somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank, but what I'm saying is when we started saying this, we didn't have any of it. We didn't have any of it. We didn't own any property. I'm going to keep saying it. I recommend you say it. Somebody say, I'm getting my buildings and my lands and my houses and my vehicles and my equipment. Somebody say, what, what I'm going to do with all that? Get it and find out. Nobody said you had to keep it all. <laughs> We're getting it. What else is going on? All of my debts are being reduced and eliminated. Every obligation, every debt, small, large, new, old, say it again, all of my debts are being reduced and eliminated. Now, if you don't believe it enough to say it, you don't believe it enough to get it. The Lord works with your words. He, he's, uh, hallelujah, the apostle of our confession, the scripture says. What else is going on? The Lord's bringing into my hands seed, even some great, big, whopper, chunk seed. Uh, the, our sowing is, is setting us up for the future, setting us up for harvest. And you don't just sow only during an offering at church. You need to be on your, on your watch at work, at home. In your neighborhood, yes, sir. strangers, yes, sir. huh? Yes, yeah. Uh, I've seen my wife, you know, pull off her jewelry and hand it to strangers in the airport. Thank you, Lord. you know, I've come home without a coat and tie <laughs> and shoes. <laughs> You're laughing, but I, <laughs> and I'm not lacking, man. I'm, I'm not lacking. It comes back. It comes back. You want, you want to be a giver. Not stingy. You want to be a liberal soul. Hallelujah. And you'll be made fat with blessings. You'll be made rich with blessings. Amen. If you believed even part of this, you couldn't be depressed about it. You'd be excited. You'd be expect. Look at your neighbors. If they believe any of this. I mean, can you detect a slightest hint of joy or excitement? Anywhere. Well, if not, just, just keep coming. You can be seated. Ushers, wait on the people.
Hello? 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 Yeah, that was the first uh, uh, 1981 or so, one of the first uh, uh, camp meetings, Brother Hagen's, that Phyllis and I went to, and Reggie Vinson was one of the uh, special guest music artists. And that was his song that he had written during that time. It's a good one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. you a believer? Yeah. You have faith? Yeah. And your faith works. Yeah. Father, all of us agree together is touching this. Asking for utterance, anointing, grace, direction, answers and help for right now. And uh, we purpose to value it hold on to it, and as you show us how it enables, put it into practice and be a doer of it. Thank you, Lord, that you're so good to us and freeing us from wrong ideas, religious and traditional ideas of men that's contrary to your word and showing us how things really are and what things really work in you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You can be seated. Thanks, guys. Sounding good. Man, I'm hearing parts. I'm hearing things are in tune. Everybody's in the same key. <laughs> nice, nice. Nice. <laughs> now, you're laughing, but it's... Uh, yeah. Doing it's not as easy as talking about it. Um, if you would go with me to Matthew, the sixth chapter. A few weeks ago, we began a, a new series for us called uh, Teach Us to Pray. Teach Us to Pray. I'm excited about this. Uh, I believe it is changing us. And that if we'll follow through, go all the way with this, we will see more and greater manifestations of the Holy Spirit in our midst and in our personal lives, day in, day out. You think it can be? I know it can. And I know it's God's will. Um, thank you, Lord. I, something I was prompted to do. Stand back up, please. And we didn't do. Um, if you've seen the news, you know uh, Israel is uh, in the midst of a war on multiple fronts. And uh, I was prompted that we should you know the Bible tells us to pray for them. And I was prompted that we should pray in particular for their leaders and their decisions that they're making. Because they are torn between making the decisions that they know they have to do to protect their people and even survive and without alienating support that they need from other countries, including us. So they need the wisdom of God. And the direction of God. So let's lift them up. Father, we do. We lift up Israel, the people, the nation. We lift up their leaders. And we, Lord, we ask you, uh, quicken them. Strengthen them. Minister comfort and peace to them. And your presence. We ask you to reveal yourself to them. Those who don't know you. Reveal yourself to them, we pray. And open their eyes and ears and heart. And uh, whatever, wherever they are, and, and whatever position they're in, we ask for wisdom and direction and guidance. Cause them to know what to do, when, how, where, with whom, and what not to do. Help them to get it right, Lord. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You in agreement with that? The Lord said, if any two of us would agree as touching anything we ask here on the earth, it'd be done for us. So do you believe that since that's his word, that's his prayer, 
They're getting help right now. Right now. All at once they're going, now nah, don't do that. Not yet. Yeah, do this. Do it now. Do it tomorrow. Do it at the end of the week. Right? They're, they're knowing what to do. We, we function by the unction or the knowing of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. No matter who you are, what your education, experience, background is, your talents, your great, no matter what, you don't know the future. You don't know enough to get every decision right out of your head. Nobody does. But the one who knows the end from the beginning, he'll show you. And you can get it right every time. Every time. Everybody said out loud, thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers, answering our prayers, and helping the leaders of Israel. Amen, amen, amen. You can be seated. Thank you, Lord, for helping me not to uh, let that slip. Glory to God. Well, that's prayer. And we're talking about prayer. You, you find in Matthew 6. Well, hold your place there and on the screen, uh, put up Luke 11, 1. You hold your place in Matthew 6. We'll move quicker this way. But uh, on the screen, it came to pass that when Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. Now, if you've been praying for 50 years, does that mean you know everything about praying? No, sir. No. Is it possible you've been praying wrong in some ways yes. Yes, for 50 years? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, there, there's always so much to learn and grow, and, and especially in this area. So they, they asked the Lord, teach us to pray. And so that's what we did beginning of this series. And so we got people today here with us that wasn't there. So let's say it again. Lord, Lord teach, us to teach us to pray. Teach me to pray. Teach me to pray. I ask it in Jesus name. Ask in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, he will. And he'll point out to us, uh, no, don't do that. And then he'll point, do this, do it this way. Go to Matthew 6 then, if you've got your place there. Matthew 6, 5 is Matthew's account of this same uh, thing we read in Luke. Because as soon as, uh, when they said, teach us to pray, right after that, the Lord gave them what we call the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Well, that's exactly what you see here in Matthew 6, the same thing. He gives them, gives us what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's actually Him teaching us to pray. And, uh, but prior to that, He gave instruction that is ans an answer of teach us how to pray. And the first thing He taught them and us is how not to pray. That's the first thing He taught. When they said teach us to pray, the first thing He did was told them what not to do. In Matthew 6, 5, he said, when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites are. Now, you, you'll find that God hates a lie. He hates it. I didn't say liar. I said a lie. He hates lying. Lying is the, the main tool of his adversary, the devil. The devil fathered lying. God did not create lying. God did not create deception. In fact, it is impossible for God to lie. Impossible. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Knowing that you can completely trust him. He will never tell you anything that's not 100% right. I mean, if he wanted to lie to us and trick us, wouldn't be anything we could do about it. Thank God. I said, thank God. He is truth itself. And as such, he absolutely hates lying and deception. And you should agree with him. 
And I should agree with him about that. Everybody said out loud, I hate lying. I hate deception. It's the work of the devil. I love the truth. Hallelujah. I love the truth. And of course, it's the truth that'll make you free. And so he said, when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites are. And the reason I've talked about lying is because that's what hypocrisy is. Hypocrisy is acting like you don't know when you do. Huh? <laughs> acting like you know when you don't. It's pretending and putting on a front and a show, which is a falseness. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Now, there's a lot of prayer that is absolutely useless. There is prayer. Let me read this to you from some other um, verses here. Don't, you don't have to turn there, but Proverbs 28, 9 says, He that turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. There are prayers that are abhorrent to God. Sometimes when you use the word prayer, people go in a hushed tone and go, oh yeah, I, ooh, prayer, you know. I, uh, yeah, but what do you mean prayer? Who are you praying to? Based on what? What are you praying? There, there are a lot of prayers. People would be much better off not praying them. And uh, Psalm 109.7, Psalm 109.7 talks about the wicked individual and that his prayer is for sin. Or his prayer is sin. There are prayers that are absolute sin. But the Bible says, thankfully, Proverbs 15, 8, the prayer of the upright is his delight. There are prayers God enjoys. He enjoys hearing them. And it always comes back to the heart of the prayer. And of course, uh, if you want to pray something that God can hear and agree with and answer, it needs to be in line with what he said. He's not going to change to accommodate you. You need to change to accommodate him. Don't you think so? And in, in John 15, uh, 7, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will and it shall be done to you. Thank you Lord. Hallelujah. But see, that's not just asking any and everything off the top of your head. That's living and walking with him. Feeding on his word all the time so that your thinking comes in line with him. And so then your praying comes in line with him. So back to Matthew 6, he said, uh, don't be like the hypocrites. They pray to be seen of men. Verse 6, but when you pray, enter your closet, which means you need one yes. <laughs> that you can call yours. And needs, needs to be a walk-in closet, right? So you can get on in there, <laughs> close the door, uh, enter your closet. And when you have shut the door, see it's got a door. Pray to your Father which is in secret and your Father which sees in secret will reward you openly. Number one, prayer needs to be something between you and God personally, not for other people to see and hear. Now there's public prayer and that's something to talk about, but that's not what you do day and night all the time. This is between you and Him. When you pray, Verse 7, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Now there are a lot of folks that, that Jesus calls heathen that pray. Right? But they pray into the wrong God. There's only one God. Now you'll hear people say, well, you know, uh, there are many ways to God and people are calling, it's the same God that are calling by different names and people they have their own ways of, uh, that, that'll send you to hell. Yeah. 
Not my words, Jesus' words. Amen. No, Jesus said, I am the way. Yeah. Not, not one way. He, he went on to say, nobody comes to the Father except by me. Now you either believe that or you don't. If you don't believe that, you don't believe the Bible. Are you a Christian? And it's going to be sad that when people die and they find out they were robbed by lies and they lost their own soul, like we were talking about earlier. That's why the number one directive is get this message out. Yes. Right? That there's only one God. There's only one Redeemer. Between God and men, it is the man, Christ Jesus. Only one. Somebody said, well, you're just narrow. Yeah, and saved. There's a broad way. Huh? That leads to destruction, Jesus said. And there's a lot of people that's on that path going right off the end into perdition and destruction. Just because you believe something doesn't make it true. Hmm? And the people say, well, there is no heaven. There is no hell. That doesn't make them disappear. <laughs> you can believe anything you want to. When you breathe your last, you're going to find out. No. You'll find the Bible is truth. Hallelujah. Immutable, eternal, perfect truth. You can build your life on it. And it's not just ink and paper. You'll find that these living words bear witness with the inside of you. Because the author of them is also inside you as a believer. And there is this witnessing with. Hallelujah. And you really have to be dishonest to be lost. What do you mean? Because people, you, you, can, you can be sure God is a faithful God. Every human being that comes old enough to understand right from wrong and good from bad, the Lord gives them an opportunity to know Him. You can be sure of it. I don't care where they were born. They might have been born to 20th generation idol worshiper. But when they were just a boy or a girl, they look up in the night sky. Something inside them tells them there's a God, a real God. Hallelujah. And if you hear just a little bit of the truth, you either accept it or you reject it. If you reject it, that's all you're going to get. That's it. You don't get any more. But if you'll receive it and believe it, no matter how, you can be in the mud, living in a cardboard box with nothing, ignorant, lost. And if you look up and you'll say, I believe, Lord, show me more. He will lead you all the way out into full salvation. He'll bring you up. He'll heal you. He will take you out of the garbage dump and set you with princes. The scripture says. If you just keep going with him, you just keep going with him, just keep following him, keep going. But at the moment you say, well, I don't believe that anymore. That's where you stop. How many want to keep going? You and me both. Let's keep going. So he said, don't pray like, like the heathen. Why? Because they got their phrases and they just loop. They just say the same thing over and over and over and over. And same, same words exactly. Over and over and over. They think, Jesus said, they'll be heard because of all their words. They're much speaking, but they won't be. And praying to these false gods. These false gods never answer to prayer. And never will. It's sad that people live and die and believe these lies. That's why our job number one is get the truth out. Yes. The gospel truth. Yes. Can you say amen? amen? Go with me if you would to the book of Isaiah. Let me see. Mm. No. Go to James 5 first. James 5 and then maybe we'll go to Isaiah. Some of these things I haven't taught this way before. 
So I'm following him. And he's helping us, right? You said you're believing with me, right? Thank you. Thank you. James 5, beginning in verse 15, he's talking about prayer. In these uh, one, two, three, four plus verses. Verse 15, he said, the prayer of faith will save the sick. Can can a right prayer change a situation? Now, we gave some definitions. What is prayer? And we talked about that prayer is communion with the Creator. Prayer is fellowship with the Father. We, we, We don't want it to be religious tradition. Communion, fellowship. And then we begin to ask and answer the question, why should we pray? We saw that Jesus prayed a lot when he's on the earth. Sometimes he'd pray all night long. Well, if there's anybody that could get by without praying, you think it was him, right? Why did he need to pray? Why did he need to pray so much? (laughs) Well, can we be successful without it? Or go ahead and say it out loud. If Jesus needed to pray, I need to pray. If Jesus prayed a lot, I need to pray a lot. Because Jesus said the servant's not above his master. Um, and so we begin to ask the question, why do we need to pray? And we begin to answer it. What the first reason we gave is because he told us to. Hmm? Right? How many think that's a good? Just by itself. All right? That, that, that should be good enough. He told us to pray. He told us repeatedly, watch and pray. Pray when you pray. And then we see in the epistles, pray without ceasing. I will that men pray everywhere. Uh, We're told to pray and not just two minutes on Sunday. We're told to pray. And that doesn't mean you you pray every breath, obviously, but you never go a day and don't pray. It's a way of life with us. Hmm? You never go a day and don't pray. That's what pray without ceasing. There's never a time when you quit praying, stop praying. And, uh, That's, he told us to pray. He told us to pray all the time. But here's a second one. And we're seeing it here already. Why pray? Because things can be changed. Things can be changed. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor, help him out and say, things can be changed. They can be changed. Well, see, here's somebody that's sick. Can that be changed? Prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. He was sick. He was in bondage. He was in condemnation, having messed up in sin. Now he's forgiven righteousness, consciousness, and healed. And the Lord connects it to praying. Verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. So obviously a sick, diseased, weak condition can be changed. You can wind up healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now the reason a lot of people don't pray is they're not really convinced it'll do any good. They're they're not fully convinced it'll make a difference. And part of that is from this doctrine of demons that is preached in churches all around the world. What? That God is controlling everything and that everything is predetermined. I said doctrine of demons. 
It has robbed so many believers. It has robbed so many church going. Because if everything's already predetermined, then it doesn't make any difference what I do right. or don't do. Right. Whatever God has predetermined is or is not going to happen. Yeah. So why do I need to pray? Yeah. See, these are lies of the devil right. to keep you from praying, to keep you from believing, to keep you from making any kind of an effort to change anything. Yeah. And acting like you're showing respect. Oh, I'm just leaving it in the hands of God. You can't leave up to him what he left up to you. Amen. And people are trying to do that all over. Well, I'm just leaving it to God. Yeah, but did he tell you to do something? Yes. They don't even know. No. Everything is not set in stone. And I'm talking about some big things. Everything is not set in stone. Things can be changed. This is some of the best news you ever heard, brother and sister. <laughs> huh? Things can be changed. Everything is not set in stone. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, somebody say, praise God, praise God. He goes on to, to describe, verse 17, he said, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. Sometimes we, we think about these patriarchs and these heroes of faith and kind of put them on a pedestal uh, floating in the air with a halo and, you know, somebody that couldn't really relate to us how carnal we've been. Oh, no. There are people just like you. Yeah, that's right. wow. Just like you, they made mistakes, sometimes whoppers. Yeah. <laughs> but they didn't give up. They didn't quit. Right. They made changes when they needed to. They, they repented when they needed to. Yeah. I mean, if God couldn't use people like us, who's he going to use? Right. Huh? Yeah. Where, on what continent do you find perfect people? There's only been one <laughs> perfect man, the master. Everybody else has come short. And God, you know, sometimes you feel for him. But he's got to work with what he has. <laughs> Is that right? and, and him being God, he, he can work it out. Is that right? <laughs> Even with less than perfect material to work with uh, says so much about him. But Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. He prayed earnestly. Literally that phrase is he prayed a prayer. Wow. Earnestly. This is the only place in the King James I know that the word the Greek word is translated earnestly. Everywhere else is translated prayer. And so the other translations bring out he prayed a prayer that it might not rain, and what happened? It didn't rain for three and a half years. That's a powerful prayer. Changed the environment. It changed the air currents, the, the, the pressures, the humidities, the air flows, the seasons, Whew. things can be changed, huh? And uh, he prayed again, verse 18, notice the language of the scripture, How, what it links it with. He prayed and this happened. And then if you want it to change, what? He prayed again, is that right? And the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now the Lord could have easily said, I decided that there'd be a, a drought. He didn't say it that way. He said Elijah. Even though he was a human, not knowing everything, and made mistakes like everybody else. What was he saying? Else? He wants you and I to realize what kind of potential is available to us. Thank you, Lord. Hmm? 
that even though we have been imperfect and made all kinds of mistakes, if we'll get serious about some things, we can pray some prayers that can absolutely change big things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Change things for years. Woo. Mm -mm -mm. Now, uh, go with me to Isaiah and let's look at this. Isaiah. What you have here is the account of uh, King Hezekiah, Isaiah 38, 1. Hezekiah is also a man subject to like passions as us. He made mistakes. The Bible tells, tells you about them. He also did some things that were right and good. One thing about the scripture, it doesn't hide people's flaws. It'll tell you about both. And uh, the Lord wants you to know that they were not some super spiritual person that you can't relate to. They're dealing with the same issues that you and I are. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. He, he wasn't just, didn't just have a bad cold. He was, uh, uh, it was terminal. Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, not I've been praying, not I have a perception, <laughs> thus saith the Lord. Now this is a different level. Of, and this is something the prophet's ministry functions in. This is beyond I perceive. No, this is I heard the Lord say this. And I'm just telling you what I heard him say. And you don't need to say that unless you did. Right? Oh, a lot of people do. But he said, thus saith the Lord. Now you got to look at the picture. Hezekiah is king. He's king of the nation. And he's in his royal bed royal bedroom with attendants. The doctors have not been able to help him. He's near death's door. Yeah. And of course, he's looking for help. <laughs> right? And, and he has full confidence in Isaiah. Everybody, everybody around there knows Isaiah is the real deal. Yeah. He's a real man of God. When he says, I heard from God, he did. So they tell him Isaiah is out in the the foyer, oh, tell him to come in. Maybe it's good news, <laughs> right? You know? yeah. Because you're pretty sure that, I, you know, Isaiah is Hezekiah's spiritual counselor. Right, mm. right. And so they, they confer on matters of state and everything else. And so he's, he, he's confident Isaiah's been praying for him. Yes. When he knows his king is near death, he's confident. So hallelujah, Isaiah is at the door. Let him in, let him in. He's not smiling though. And Hezekiah looks at him in his weakened condition and the prophet says, thus saith the Lord, set your house in order. That don't sound good. <laughs> huh? For you shall die and not live. You shall die. Not you might. Yeah. And this is not just some man or woman's idea. This is thus saith the Lord. Now to hear a lot of people talk, if there was a thus saith the Lord, that is set in stone. Yeah, how quiet it got. Have you read this? Yes. Was it set in stone? No. Huh? Huh? But uh, Hezekiah 
He heard that. Uh, don't you know those words hit him? Because he's seen Isaiah prophesy before. And he's seen it come to pass. To the letter. And so this is, most everybody would say, this is it. I mean, what's the point in praying about this? The Lord said, get your business in order. Set your house in order. Call the attorneys in. Make sure your will's right. Because you shall die. And you're not going to live. Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> mm-hmm. Verse 2, help me out. <laughs> then Hezekiah. Huh? I, I, if, you, if you read the rest of the um, account, then Isaiah didn't stay long. Well, you know, what can he say? He just told him he's going to die. So Isaiah leaves. And, and Hezekiah, notice what he didn't do. I'm still talking about what Jesus told us. Jesus said, don't pray to be seen of men. And don't pray vain repetitions. What does that mean? You got to get your eyes off men. Period. Hezekiah turned his face uh, toward the wall. What do you see when your nose is six inches from the wall? Nothing. Hmm? There is nothing to distract you. And he prayed not to Hezekiah, not, not to Isaiah. Hmm? Not, not to Isaiah. He prayed to the Lord. Now, let, let's talk about why this account is in the scriptures. He didn't just roll over and cry. He didn't just turn over and cry his eyes out and say, well, you know, I wanted to live longer. Huh? I'm not that old. But the Lord said, what are you going to do with that? Hmm? He didn't say, go get Isaiah. Get him back in here. And grill him about it. Huh? Now what exactly did he say? Do you think that really means dead, die, die? You know, is there any leeway? <laughs> you know? Uh, or pressuring him. You, you need to go back and talk to him, Isaiah. You need to, uh-uh. Mm-mm. Faith doesn't put pressure on people. Real faith in God goes straight to God. Looks to God. That's why he turned his face to the wall. He don't, he don't want to think about Isaiah. He don't want to think about any of his attendants, anybody that's around in the room or outside. Clear the room. Why? It's time to get serious, brother. Is that right? The clock is ticking here. Hmm? What did he do? He turned his face toward the wall and he prayed. Oh, somebody say prayed. He prayed. Unto the Lord. Yes, sir. He said, Lord, remember, I beseech thee, how I have walked before you in truth and with a perfect heart. I've done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. He said, Lord, I, I, I've been trying to straighten this place out. And he had been. He had been. He had made, made some good changes and was helping turn the country around, getting it headed in the right direction. And he said, God, you know, I'm doing what I know to do. <laughs> Have mercy on me. Is he serious? He's crying. Is that right? He's crying. He's praying. And for whose benefit? Isaiah's gone. Right? He had, I guess he had everybody leave the room. He just, he's nose next to the wall. He's not looking at anybody else. He's not thinking about anybody else. He is focusing completely on God. He's talking to him. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah. Now, if you read 1 Kings, it says before he had gone through the middle court. He's not even outside the royal grounds. 
before he had gone through the middle court. So this is not a lot of time elapsed. This is minutes. Minutes. Do you know when you really get serious with God, it don't have to take all day or all week. The word of the Lord came to Isaiah and said, go, turn around, and go back and say to Hezekiah, thus saith the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. Oh. Is that music to a dying man's ears? I have heard your prayer. I saw your tears. I saw your tears. When they drip down your face. Behold means look. And look here. I'm going to add to your days 15 years. I'm going to give you another 15 years. Well, somebody say, things can be changed. Things can be changed. Oh, much of the church does not know this. But it's right here. It's all through the Word of God. He said, I've heard your prayer, Hezekiah. I saw your tears. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. I saw you meant business. I saw your heart. I got you. So uh, what about that, thus saith the Lord, you're going to die? I thought the Lord never changes. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said it? Shall he not do it? Has he spoken? Shall he not make it good? Well, what happened here? Because the Lord said, set your house in order, you shall die and not live. Here's the thing. Did Hezekiah change God? Those verses we just quoted, God doesn't change. He is perfection. He is right. He doesn't need to change. Hmm? So Hezekiah did not change God. And you won't change God. And I won't change God and thank God. Nobody can change God, because what a mess that would be. Thank God. Huh? But something changed. I said something changed. Right? Keep reading. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add to your days 15 years. Before the prayer, there were hours or days before they're going to have a funeral. After the prayer, 15 more years of life. Mm -mm -mm. Hallelujah. Notice what else he said. And I will deliver you in this city out of the hand of a king of Syria. I will defend this city. Verse 9, and, you know, we preached about this a while back. They also God, right? I mean, God can do more than one thing. These are two big truths. God can do more than one thing at a time. And God can do a thing more than one way. More than one way. Some years ago, Phyllis and I were looking at a direction of ministry. And because of some things that happened, man, it, it really looked like it was the Lord. And it felt like it. And there were indications that it was. And we were making steps that way. And then some of the leaders on the other side, they came back with some 
requirements and demands that were not what we had in our heart. And I took it to prayer. And as months went by, they just were demanding and requiring more and more and this and that. And uh, finally, the Lord said to me, let them alone. Leave them alone. And then not long after that, a different direction. Same kind of thing, but a completely different location and direction. And that puzzled me though. I thought, Lord, now hold on. You don't change. Am I missing it some here? Because how can both of these be right? I mean, if that was you, how could this be you? And this is what he brought to my remembrance. He said, don't you remember that uh, when the, Moses was up on the mount getting the Ten Commandments and all the, those things, and, and down at the base, they made the gold calves and worshipped them and said, Israel, these are your gods that brought you out of Egypt? Oh, it made the Lord angry. Whew. Amen. And it hadn't been two months since they heard the voice of God speaking out of the fire, the Ten Commandments, and anybody remember what number one was? You shall have no other God. Huh? And right after that, you don't make any graven images? Six weeks ago. (laughs) Yeah, but now think about this. Why was that the very thing they were tempted to do? Why that? Well, why was Adam and Eve tempted to eat the one thing in the garden? Right? (laughs) That's the devil. The devil was pouring it on. You know, they didn't realize what was going on, but there were these thoughts bombarding their minds. You need a gold calf. Oh, you've got to have a gold calf. Gold calf's going to solve your problems. It came from the enemy. But when they did that, it was, a, it was a catastrophic sin in God's eyes. And this is before grace was available <laughs> in Christ and all of that. And, and the Almighty said, he said, leave me alone. Get out of my way. I'm going to wipe them out. And I can start over with you, Moses. I'll make of you a greater nation than them. Well, now, hold on. Didn't God pick them? Huh? Well, then how could it be right for him to say, well, forget them and start over with Moses? It was their choices. This changing what's going to happen. They're not changing God. Oh, come on. Can you see this? Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. Something happened in him. Can you see that? He humbled himself before the Lord God. He cried out to him. He got serious. I mean, he's the king. He's just everybody kowtowing around him. But here he is crying like a baby. Is that right? With his nose up against the wall, humbling himself. And whatever needed to happen, happened. And and, before Isaiah got out of the courtyard, he said, "Uh, stop, stop. So Isaiah's just leaving. He goes, yes, turn around. Okay. Go back. Tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. I heard your prayer, boy. I saw your tears. Glory to God. Would he hear our prayer? Would he see our tears? Now what this prayer is, is a prayer of supplication. Now you'll find, you know, our our, uh, master verse that we use in prayer time all around is what uh, all the time is uh, 1 Timothy 2, is that right? In the first couple of verses. Uh, And he talks about, uh, he wants us to pray uh, supplications Prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. Different kinds of praying. This is not the prayer of faith. Laying hold on something, believing you receive it. 
This is not the prayer of faith. Now, we, we read in James, talking about the prayer of faith that saved the sick. That is the prayer of faith. That's a different kind of praying. But here, uh, you might say, well, he, he could stand on the Word of God. He has just received the Word of God. You're going to die. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> He's got a word from the Lord. <laughs> so, this is not about standing on your rights or laying hold of what's been provided. Uh uh-uh. uh. Mm mm. This is supplication. Hmm? Another word is entreaty, entreating the Lord, asking Him humbly, looking to the one that no matter what it is and no matter why it is that way, you still know somebody who can change it. Oh, come on. You still know somebody who can change it. Now, some things he can't change because it would violate his word in other situations and sometimes, especially with other people. You don't know everything that led up to it, but you can still ask. Hmm? Sometimes the Lord will say, leave it alone. That's between me and them. Hmm? And if he does, leave it alone. Other times, he'll say, I heard your prayer. Oh, hallelujah. I heard your prayer. I saw your heart. I'm going to give you this. Woo. Mercy. Grace. Completely undeserved. Completely undeserved. Unmerited. Oh, but he, just because you asked him to. Just because you asked him to. He said, I, I, I'm going to give you 15 years and I'm going to deliver you and this city and I'm going to give you a sign from the Lord. Glory to God. Look down in verse 20. This is something that is eye-opening. Hezekiah wrote this after he was healed and delivered. He came to this realization. He said, the Lord was ready to save me. He realized the Lord was ready to save me when he told me I was going to die. But what? Under the current circumstances, if somebody else didn't change, that's what's going to happen. You know the Lord was ready to save him because Isaiah hadn't got outside the courtyard yet. Is that right? I mean, how long had Hezekiah been praying? Couldn't have been over minutes. I mean, even if uh, Isaiah stopped at the coffee bar on the way out, or, or what, he, couldn't have been long. And uh, Hezekiah says, The Lord was ready to save me. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen to Psalm 1, don't turn there, but they'll put it on the screen. Psalm 106. 23. Psalm 106, 23. We're answering the question, why pray? Right? Number one reason we said is what? He told us to. The Lord told us to. Told us to do it all the time as a way of life. And what else are we talking about today? Because things can be changed. Even things that were absolutely set to happen. Mm. Things can be changed. He said, therefore, he said that he would not destroy them. This is that account that I just told you about. You know, when they made that gold calf and all that. Had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. They would have been destroyed. Not might. They would have been. You got to remember, this has happened before. Noah's time. I mean, the whole population of the planet was wiped out except eight people in the ark. 
and they deserved it. I'm talking about the people that were wiped out. They deserved it. This place was nonstop evil and violence. It had gone so total out of control, it grieved God himself. And the devil's trying to get it there again. He's always trying to, but God, one thing, one reason is because he, he wants to see man destroyed. He hates man. He hates us. And he knows he can't just indiscriminately take us all out, but if he can get us to go evil enough, judgment will come on us. He can get us to get ourselves judged if we listen to him. But you and I are not ignorant of his evil devices and plans and schemes and thoughts. And by the grace of God, we're not going that way. No matter what the world does, we're not going that way. We're the salt of the earth. And God can keep us in the midst of this dark place. One thing that's going to be a part of that is praying. We're going to pray. Ezekiel 22.30, Ezekiel 22.30, he said, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them and consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way I've recompensed upon their heads, says the Lord God. He's the righteous judge of all the earth. He has to do what's right, even when he's not pleased with the judgments. But notice uh, what he was doing back up to verse 30. He was looking for somebody that would have interceded and asked him to spare them. But nobody did. So he didn't have a choice. Nobody asked him for mercy and grace. So and so that's why Hezekiah had this revelation. He realized after he was healed, the Lord was ready to save me when he told me I was going to die. Why tell you? Why not just let you die? You'll soon be dead anyway. Why didn't he just let you die? The Lord was wanting somebody to wake up and get a clue and get serious and let's make some changes and let me, let God would say, let me change your situation. But under these conditions, this is what's going to happen. We're answering the question, why pray? Can anybody see good reason to pray? Whew. Glory to God. Go to uh, uh, the book of Jonah. This is one of the most beautiful places in the scripture describing this. Uh, the prayer of supplication is a prayer of asking the Lord something you do, you do not deserve Something that's not owed to you. You don't have a right to it. Intercession is you asking for somebody else. You don't per se intercede for yourself. You're inter- interceding for somebody else. Using your relationship with God, asking on their behalf. That's what Moses did, right? When God told him, step back, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to start over with you. I'll make, I'll make a better nation out of you. And people say, well, yeah, but I mean, it took, you know, uh, what, four or 500 years to get to that place. That's nothing to God. That's half a day. Right? Yeah. If it took all day. Okay. We'll have a better group here. (laughs) Uh, uh, um, But supplication, you can supplicate for yourself. 
asking, entreaty. Jonah 1. Anybody read the book of Jonah? Yeah. Just four short chapters. You ought to read it again. It's great. Jonah 1.1, 1, 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. And you know the story? Uh, Jonah ran. <laughs> he ran the other direction <laughs> to get away from this mission and this directive from God. Ran. And you know the story. He's on this ship. He shouldn't have been on. Trying to go somewhere he shouldn't be going. And man, they hit a storm. And they're not going to make it. And uh, they, they find him below deck asleep. And they, they woke him up and said, would you wake up and call on your God? They were all calling on their different gods. Call on your God that we may be saved. Don't you know what's going on here? And so then they cast lots to see who is the culprit, this, this source of this problem. And the lot fell on Jonah. <laughs> And so they said, and they're holding on to the ropes and the waves are crashing and the wind's blowing. And they said, they're yelling, tell us, what, what did you do? So he tells them. And then they said, why'd you do that? <laughs> and so they said, what do we do to get out of this? And he said, you're going to have to pick me up and throw me overboard. Now think about that. Yeah. He's not afraid to die. Can you see that? He's not afraid to die. Pick me up, throw me over. At least I ain't going to Nineveh. <laughs> That's one way to get out of it. <laughs> and so they, they didn't want to do it. And they rode hard and tried to get out of it, but it's just getting worse. And they know they've already thrown out their cargo and everything else, nothing else they can do. They know any moment this little ship's going to break into pieces. They're going down. They're all going to die. And so they, they prayed to God and they said, Lord, don't, don't hold this man's blood against us. And they picked him up and they threw him over. <laughs> and just as he's about to hit this giant fish <laughs> comes up and gulp and heads down into the deep. The Bible said God had prepared a great fish. Now people mock and scoff at that and said, you know, a human being couldn't live inside of a, have you ever tried it? How do you know? <laughs> some of these creatures are huge, yeah. right? Yeah. There can be some big pockets of air in there. I don't know, but I, regardless of the fact, the Bible said God prepared the fish. Hmm? You could live on the moon if God prepares it, right? Or wherever. God prepared the fish. And so, I don't know if you've heard or not, but Brother Jesse Duplantis tells of his experience going to heaven. He said he saw different, said he saw David, he saw Paul, he said he saw Jonah. And he said, uh, he spoke to him for a moment and he thought, well, for some reason he thought, well, this is my chance to get my question answered. He said, uh, Jonah, you know, what was it that, that, that you were in? Was it a whale? Was it, what was it? And he said, when he said it, he knew he had said the wrong thing. He saw Jonah's face and he said, Jonah looked at him and said, Jesse, I was in disobedience. Oh, wow. He said, yeah, right. Right. <laughs> But that just shows you, you got to watch about going after the wrong thing and missing the big thing. People get into technicalities and miss the whole point. <laughs> he said the moment he said it, he saw Jonah's face. He said, oh, I said the wrong thing. <laughs> and then Jonah said, well, I mean, is it, is it polite to keep bringing up to people their mistakes a thousand years from now? <laughs> he said, Jesse, I was in disobedience. But anyway, he is in the, the belly of this specially prepared huge fish 
for three days and nights. And the scripture tells us this is uh, representative of Christ in the heart of the earth. That's good. And the scripture said, from the belly of hell, Jonah prayed and cried. Could God hear your prayer? Yes. Thousands of feet on the bottom of the ocean. He said, he said, weeds were wrapped around my head. Don't you know that was an awful experience, man? That was, that was a bad one. And uh, what, what she did, should he have done? Obey God. Just obey God. But anyway, uh, God heard his prayer. And God spoke to the fish. And the fish cruised up to the shore and vomited um, Jonah out. So he's laying there. <laughs> Don't you know he's glad to be out? Oh, <laughs> whoo. And in chapter three, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the preaching that I bid thee. You know, the Lord doesn't change, right? You may go through a lot of stuff till you understand he's not gonna change, but you could make it easy on yourself and respond right the first time. So he said, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the preaching that I bid thee. And this time, Jonah got up and got it in gear and went to Nineveh. <laughs> Woo. According to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. It would take you three days to walk across it. And verse four, Jonah began to enter the city after getting about a day's journey into it. He stops on some street corner and he begins to declare. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Because that's what the Lord told him to say. Is this the word of the Lord? It was so important that no matter what Jonah tried to do to run away and get away from it, none of it worked. God wanted this word proclaimed. Yes. He wanted it done and he could have used somebody else, but Jonah was his first pick. And uh, this word overthrown is the same word that describes what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Wow. And from the other things we see, Nineveh was obviously a real sinful place evil, bad place, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, they were completely destroyed. Hailstones, fire, I mean, it wiped off the map. That's what the Lord said was going to happen to this city three days journey across in 40 days. Less than two months. So, uh, Jonah did, he, he declared that. Verse five, the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Every, I mean, everybody. And when the word came to the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, he laid off his robe from him, covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles and said, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Don't let them feed. Don't let them drink water. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. That's prayer. Cry out to God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. That was why judgment was coming on them. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn from his fierce anger so that we perish not? What had happened, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah was about to happen to these people. Just days away from it. The Lord said it was. But, but, they, they changed, they repented, they humbled themselves, they prayed, 
And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he said that he would do to them and he did it not. So 40 days came and and went and on day 41, the rooster crowed. The sun came up. Day 45, day 50, everything's cool, everything's great. No destruction, no judgment. Jonah was mad. Oh, he was he was mad. He was so mad. Chapter 4, verse 1. It displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed to the Lord. Like we said, not all prayers are good. He said, I pray you, O Lord. Wasn't this my saying when I was yet in my country? That's why I got on the boat and went to Tarshish because I knew. I knew. You're a gracious God. You're a merciful God. You're slow to anger, great kindness, and you will repent of the evil. Now, his prophecies looks like he's a false prophet and no good. He's preached this all over this giant city. And the 40 days have come and gone. False prophet. (laughs) He thinks he'd just rather die than live with the shame. (laughs) Now, was that some kind of a, I don't know, psychology trick telling them that they'd be destroyed in 40 days? Or would that have happened? Did they change God? No, they didn't change. They changed. They changed. And it pleased God. He didn't want to see them destroyed to to begin with. But they'd been headed towards it who knows how many years. And it had just gotten to the place where it couldn't go on any longer. Unless. I said unless. Unless somebody prayed. Genuinely. Go to 1 John in closing. 1 John 5 and 14. This is New Testament. 1 John 5, 14. Actually, uh, well, yeah, we'll just start here. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, no matter how we feel or how it looks, what do we know? He He hears us. Verse 15, and if we know he heard us, because we know we asked according to his will. If we asked according to his word, we know that's his will. So regardless of how we feel about it, if we asked anything according to his word and his will, we know he heard us. We know he heard us. He said he did. And if we know he heard us, what else do we know? We know. We have the petition. He, he's not going to tell you something in his word and then not answer it. We have the petition. It's granted to us that we desired of him. Now keep going. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. If a person knows God and is matured to a certain point and they reject Jesus knowingly, willingly, and they do disrespect to the blood that bought them, that can be something the Lord would tell you, leave them alone. Don't pray for them. But other than that, and a lot of people are not even mature enough to do that. It's a fact. Other than that, there's a lot of things that if you ask the Lord to have mercy on somebody else concerning a sin that they have done and and, and mistakes that they have made, a prayer of supplication, God 
will give them life yes. because you asked for it. Thank you. Oh, what a merciful God he is. What a great, kind God he is. I, uh, years ago, I was praying for an individual. And dear me, they had, they had had that I knew of a thousand opportunities to get things right and the mercy of God and just keep on making the wrong choice, going the wrong way. And I saw they are about to be in a bad, bad way. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I know, I know they don't deserve it. I know they hadn't listened to you. They've done everything in the world except listen to you. But have mercy on them. Have mercy on them. Give them another opportunity to repent, to get it right. He spoke to my heart. He said, Keith, I'm going to do that. Just because you asked me to. Isn't that what this is talking about? Yeah. Just because you asked me to. Isn't that what he was saying uh, concerning judgment coming on a whole nation? I sought for somebody that would stand in the gap, stand in between the, the judgment in them and, and plead the case before me. And there were cases where he couldn't find anybody that would even speak up and ask. You know what? Uh, when Abraham uh, talked to the Lord and uh, his nephew Lot and their family were there in, in Sodom and, and the Lord told him, he said, shall I hide from Abraham what's about to happen? And he told him, he said, the cry of the evil of this place has come up before me and, and, and he sent angels down to check this out and he told him that there's going to be destroyed. And, but why tell him? He wanted Abraham to ask him about it. Yeah. Right? Can you see this? Why, why do this? Why come by there? And so Ab Abraham, he said, uh, shall not the, 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 the righteous judge of all the earth do right? You know, we, we, will you let the innocent be destroyed with the wicked? Uh, this is not what the righteous judge does. Uh, the, the Lord doesn't do that. He said, what if? We could find 50. And this is a whole giant city like, like Nineveh. Two cities, actually. What if we could find 50, uh, you know, righteous people among all these? And the Lord said, I'll spare it for 50. Now, now, why am I saying this? A lot of you know this, but what am I saying? Things are changing. Oh, come on. Can you see this or not? The, the whole places were going to be wiped off the map. But now, if we can find 50... It's two cities saved. Yeah. Wow. Even though they're full of evil. Yeah. Mercy, mercy. Yes, and then he says, well, Lord, what if we're five short? <laughs> what if we're five short? And, and the Lord said, I'll spare the place for 45. And you remember, Abraham kept going. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. And then he got to 10. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> he said, Lord, you know, be patient with me. And I know he feels like he's pushing it, right? He's push, he, I know that this is intercession. Wow. It's prayer, it's intercession, but it's not religious junk, ritual. Yeah. It's communion. Can you see this? It's communion, it's fellowship. It's asking, it's, it's receiving answers, it's, it's communing. And he said, he said what, if, what if we can only find 10? <laughs> only 10. And this is a city of, I, I guess, at least scores of thousands. And, and the Lord said, uh, I'll spare the place for 10. And I think Abraham really thought he had it. I, I do. I think he thought just his kinfolks, right? But what he didn't realize is uh, not only was his kinfolks in Sodom, Sodom had gotten in them. And there weren't 10, there probably weren't five. That's why the place was so near judgment. But can you see that as he's praying and talking to him, outcomes are being changed. Yeah. At every juncture, outcomes are being changed. This stuff about it's all predetermined. It's all predestined. 
God is controlling everything in everybody. It's not true. I said it's not true. Everything is not set in stone. And that's why we pray. I said that's why we pray. Because God will hear a sincere, hallelujah, right heart prayer. Especially a scripture quoting prayer. Come on, y'all listening to me. Somebody that really loves God, that really cares about people, and there were things he will do, and there are situations he will spare, and there are people that will live that would have died. People that will be spared, that would have been destroyed and consumed because you asked. Can you say amen? Stand on your feet, everybody. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Stand on your feet, everybody. Lift your hands. Lift your voice. Oh, lift your hands. Lift your voice. Say thank you to the Lord. 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 Altar workers come down. Thank you to the Lord. 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 Let me lead you in a prayer couple of prayers. We don't know who's in the house or who's watching online or who will watch this even later, but everybody say affirm or reaffirm your faith. Say, Father God, I believe in you, the almighty God, and I, I reverence you, and I honor your name, and I thank you that you've given us your son, Jesus that he died on the cross. He paid for all my sins. And that you've raised him from the dead. Alive. Free from sin. Thank you for saving me through what he has done. I receive Jesus and all he has done for me. Jesus, I confess you Lord of my life, my Savior, my healer, my provider, my protector, my deliverer, thank you for saving me. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. And everybody pray this as well. Say, Lord, I see the value of communing with you. And I am confident that you hear my prayers and you see my heart and you know and I thank you for using me in these things to pray a prayer, to ask a thing that you would that we should. Praying for others as well as myself. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for grace. And thank you for changing things by your great power. Oh, hallelujah. Lift your hands. Lift your voice. Say thank you, Lord. 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 prayer for the first time, don't rush out of here. Come down to the front. These people are ready. Celebrate with you. Pray with you. If you want somebody to pray with you to be filled with the Spirit or about something else, about a healing or whatever, we're convinced in here God hears and answers prayers. Hallelujah. Things 
can be changed. Woo! Does that do anything for you, Ben? That, that just goes off in me. Things can be changed. Woo! Glory to God. Well, thank you for being so respectful and staying. We went a few minutes over, but y'all have been booked right there. So uh, it is the joy and honor of my life to minister the word to you. What, what a privilege. Thank you. Thank you for receiving us. Let's sing it as we go. Let's celebrate as we go and give thanks to God. For the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Yes, the Lord is good.